question is something I would have to check on, and this is a, a mention there of a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, or well, actually, with Umar ibn Khattab had written to some of the Sahaba saying, uh, put your drinks on boil until the share of Satan disappears from them, for he has two shares and you have one. Uh, whether this refers to uh, drinks, meaning the ones which may have, have fermented, that you put them on boil, because if you boil them, then the alcohol will evaporate from it. Right? And... Uh, uh, what remains will be okay. Obviously, we'll still have some alcohol in it, but it won't be uh, of the level of intoxication. I mean, this I, I would have to double check uh, to get the what did the scholars say with regards to this particular hadith. But we know, I mean, this was Omar ibn al-Khattab telling them to do that. Perhaps because there's some other circumstance around it. One would need to know why did he send this? You know, it may be because somebody was complaining that they have some fermented drinks they're drinking there and they're, you know, shaky, they're borderline or whatever. So he instructed them to do this because this was not the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu right? Well, what the Prophet Sallallahu said is that if you, uh, because they did have these fermented drinks, if you have a fermented drink, you see, if you make fermented drinks, you can use it for three days. If you make it, once it ferments, you're allowed three days. After the third day, you have to throw it. Yeah, once it, it, it turns, it's called nabiv, right? Once it turns, right, the process starts, right? Some bubbling or, you know, you can get some tang starts to develop in it. Then that process is starting. It means some alcohol is being produced, you know, but its quantities are too small to affect you, right? So, for the first three days, once the process started, this is in Sahih Bukhari, you know, you can use it, but after the third day, because from that point onward, then it starts to, the quantity of alcohol in it starts to increase and reaches the point where you can become intoxicated. So, this hadith also is used, you know, to show that, uh, also that, if there is a minute quantity of alcohol, in a drink or in a food, this doesn't automatically make it haram. This is the point, right? This is a this is a legal issue. Some people, those people who look at alcohol as being najis, right? Because this are the because based on the same ayah on page thirty six, Allah says there, you know, indeed intoxicants are najis, right? Are filth, right? From the Work of Satan. Abomination is the term used here. But in Arabic, it's najis. And najis means, oh, rigis, sorry, rigis, rigis, which means, you know, filth. Like, like najis. But the, that's why they translate it as abomination as opposed to filth. Because really, it's not a physical thing. Because similarly with the arrowheads and the altars, these are not filth. If you touch them, it doesn't make, there's no najasa involved here. So anyway, so this is the point where people go overboard. Today, you have these books which, you know, have uh, all these lists of substances, you know, if you have C325X, you know, in it, it's got, you know, some molecules of pig fat or some molecules of this and that. These things are irrelevant. Now, if we are making something, we would not choose to do this. But if something comes to us and it has some, you know, minute, you know, or like, or like the enzyme, even when it, minute quantities, really, it's halal. Because we have a general principle that small amounts of najasa in large amounts of what is tahir doesn't affect it, right? And you took that hadith in your fiqh. إِذَا بَلَغَ الْمَاءُ كُلَّتَيْنِ If the water reaches, you know, two huge uh, quantities, uh, 
Okay, what exactly what kulatain is, of course, the scholars differed what it actually meant. But it meant a large amount of water. You know? Somebody urinates in the swimming pool. Kids, they go swimming in there, and they're urinating in the swimming pool. I mean, what? Swimming pool. You know, that's not going to affect you. Or you go to a lake. You see somebody at the other end of the lake urinating in the lake. You know, can you drink the water from the lake? Yes, you can. You know. So, similarly, even minute quantities like this of alcohol, you know, don't automatically make something impermissible. Just like anything basically that ferments. I mean, fermentation process. Even the making of yogurt. If you go and analyze yogurt uh, chemically, you're going to find small quantities of alcohol in it. And vinegar, which you use. Vinegar is made, it has to go through the process of alcohol. So even after the vinegar is made, there's still some alcohol remaining in it. It doesn't all completely turn to alcohol, to, to, to vinegar, right? So that process is on. Prophet Sallallahu just said, you know, when you start the process, you don't take the lid until after such and such a point when it was complete. So all of this points to the fact that, you know, we don't need to go to the extremes that some people have gone to in terms of minute quantities of alcohol. But we don't make it. We don't make, if we, if to, to produce, for example, say you go to a restaurant and they, they, French, for example, they love to cook with alcohol, right? So they, you know, put some, uh, alcohol in a dish, right? And then they cook it up and when they heat it and everything. So it gives it the kind of a taste, but then it's evaporated. What remains has been touched by alcohol. But if you eat that, you eat a ton of it. You kill yourself before you even become intoxicated. It's not going to intoxicate you. So then it's not considered to be an intoxicant. Now, so you could eat of that. But now, can you do that? Can you buy a bottle of alcohol, dump it in your room? No, no, you can't do that. As a Muslim, you're not allowed to buy alcohol or serve it or sell it or, you know. So we can't produce it. But I'm saying if it comes to us through some other channel, it is edible. It's considered edible. No, as far as the medicines are concerned, there is... Okay, brother's asking about medicines which have quantities of... Intoxicants it may not be alcohol, it could be codeine, it could be some other things, right? Which uh, people use for intoxicating purposes. You know, where, where these uh, medicines have this, well, technically speaking, we shouldn't use them. Because they are. You, you take a, you know, Robotessins, that's the famous one, which in, in, we know in, in the West, in America, people was a, a drug of choice. Robotessins, it's yeah. called, you know. You, Drink a few bottles of that, and you're you're flying. <laughs> so that is uh, that is not acceptable for a Muslim to take that. You know, you have alternative medicines, and you have to use them. Uh, but now, if for for a particular treatment you have no alternative, that is the only thing available. Then you use it to the degree that you have to to prevent you know whatever harm you're trying to prevent through it. Yeah, that that falls in the same category. But this question concerning vanilla extract, right? Which, as a Muslim, because it's, you know, if it has, say, 10% uh, alcohol, they put the vanilla uh, in a 10% solution of alcohol. Meaning that if you were to take that bottle of vanilla, pour a few of them in a glass, you got enough of them, 10% is enough to get you high. Right? If you got a full glass full of it. So it's, so that's your, that's your criterion. What will intoxicate in large amounts is forbidden in small amounts. So if that substance that with a 10% is 10% alcohol enough to intoxicate you, and if you take a full glass of it, a couple of glasses or three glasses, it's enough. It's enough to do it. You just, you need a few glasses. It's not to the extreme. But you have to take a gallon, you know, then we don't count like this, because gallon, you will kill yourself before a gallon has an intoxicating effect. But just from 
two, three glasses or four, five glasses of it, you can be intoxicated, then it's forbidden. So it would be, in, it would be forbidden for Muslims to use this, to purchase it and use it, because it's an intoxicating uh, liquid product or whatever. But if they put it in cake, if relatives use it and put it in cake, and they cook the cake, when the cake is heated, it evaporates. The alcohol content, content of it mostly evacu- eva- evaporates. So the cake which remains has the taste of the vanilla. Maybe there's some minute quantities of alcohol in it, but not sufficient. You know, if it's a cake where, you know, you have the rum cake, you have these wine cakes and that, which, which, you know, they've put so much in it, you know, that you, even when you take a slice, you know, you're getting a buzz, right? If you, if that's happening, yeah, you know, <laughs> the, that, the, that kind, then no, you know, that's haram. It's not acceptable. But the ones where it's just vanilla, where it's just a flavoring and, you know, you've, they've cooked it in the oven and everything and you, you have it and you don't feel anything. There's nothing involved. There's nothing, you can't feel anything happening. Then that's permissible. Yeah. So the rheumatism and the benefit, I'm sorry. And those cold medicines, medicine. cold medicines, which are in fact intoxicating uh, substances, really, uh, should not be taken. As a Muslim, there are alternatives, you know, we, we use the alternatives. We only revert to such medicines where you have no other choice. There's nothing else available, right? And it's something you have to deal with.